turn it over to you. Thank you, Melissa. That was a nice introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time of your uh, busy day to um, uh, increase your knowledge uh, in regard to rheumatology in general and uh, lupus in particular. Um, yeah, we wanted to start the uh, presentation to try and introduce our team. Um, so um, we have the um, Musculoskeletal Center that it's located on the Vestal Parkway. Um, it's the building across of the Binghamton University. It's been there since 2016. Uh, we're really very lucky to um, kind of establish this musculoskeletal center uh, as part of the UAHS that includes um, all the specialty that are involved in addressing uh, treating, diagnosing uh, uh, pathologies related to the muscle, joint, and tendon, so the skeletal uh, body. Uh, these specialties include uh, orthopedics, sports medicine, rheumatology, chiropractic, podiatry, uh, physiatry, and the concussion clinic. Um, it's been very successful. Uh, it's really easy to uh, do a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach to the patient, which means that if somebody's seeing a podiatry provider uh, and they think, okay, this is not just a, a, a foot pain, it's so easy to kind of transition that patient from one department to another because we kind of cross paths in a lot of uh, uh, um, diagnoses or problems. So what is a rheumatologist? A rheumatologist is a physician um, who receives further training um, after either internal medicine or pediatrics uh, with a special focus on uh, detection and treatment of musculoskeletal and autoimmune conditions. Um, and if you do your internal medicine, then transition into rheumatology, you'll be an adult rheumatologist. If you do the training, you start with the pediatrics, then you add the rheumatology, you'll be a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, so when we talk about autoimmune diseases or autoimmune conditions, uh, what are these? It's a myriad of different pathology where the immune system is supposed to be, you know, fighting things that should not be part of your body. It starts sending these messages of inflammation to area of the body when it's not needed. And with that, you cause damage and how that's how symptoms starts. And these diseases can affect muscles, joint, bone, and other organs. So that's kind of in a nutshell, what are these autoimmune diseases and why do you need to see a rheumatologist and possibly other specialists to try and get to the bottom of this? So I'm proud to um, introduce our team um, of uh, rheumatology UHS. Uh, that includes three physicians and three nurse practitioners. We were really lucky that to add two new rheumatologists since uh, October of 2020. And uh, Dr. Pawaskar just joined us. Um, yeah. And uh, Dr. Ludo uh, is on vacation, but you'll be able to meet her in future lectures because we're doing these uh, monthly uh, series and with different provider giving different uh, uh, lectures. The um, other part of the teams are the nurse practitioners. So I wanted to talk about what is a nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioners are uh, licensed uh, independent clinicians uh, focused on managing people's health conditions and preventing diseases. So with their advanced clinical training, a nurse practitioner um, are able to diagnose, treat, and provide evidence-based health education uh, to their patients. Our nurse practitioners have been trained and work closely with uh, our providers uh, to care for our immunocompromised patients. Uh, 
Um, Nicole Osterhout uh, is one of our nurse practitioners. Sarah Smith is the second one, and Colette O'Brien is the third one. And that kind of uh, concludes the introduction to UHS Rheumatology uh, Department. Now we'll move to uh, talk um, further in detail in regard of one of our autoimmune diseases, which is systemic lupus erythematosus. We'll talk about the type of lupus, the definition, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment. We'll touch superficially on that. I mean, I think each uh, subtype, we can kind of talk about either one for hours, but we'll try and do a little introduction and I'm happy to address any questions. So what is lupus? Lupus is an autoimmune disease. It's chronic. Uh, it causes inflammation and pain. The um, trigger or the cause of lupus is still unknown, but uh, we'd like to label it as multifactorial. And what that means is there is different component that play a role together with the end result of this immune malfunction. Research is still going on and what triggers and what is the cause of lupus, but uh, for now, um, we still kind of empty handed in that uh, um, department. So it can affect any organs um, from head to toe. Uh, we'll go through the different symptoms and features, but you know, skin, joint, kidneys, um, uh, lung, heart, eye involvement. Um, and it's usually uh, likes to affect young uh, patients the most. It's definitely debilitating. It affects your day-to-day -day, you know, uh, uh, routine. And uh, that's why I put this uh, uh, little uh, uh, cartoon where I would say I was going to clean my house, but lupus said, lupus said no, you know. Uh, so you really have to adjust your uh, schedule and expectations uh, depending on um, how uh, these patients feel from day to day. So further uh, details when it comes to the uh, symptoms, uh, as we said, um, head to toe, uh, that could include, you know, low grade fever, headaches with some um, brain involvement, uh, uh, the rash, uh, there's different variety of rash, including the most typical one that uh, we hear about, the butterfly, uh, photosensitivity, so kind of, um, that uh, you could uh, not feel well the day of, you know, long exposure to sun, uh, definitely triggering rashes is not unusual. Um, also weakness, fatigue, change in the weight, uh, hair loss, um, the shortness of breath or chest pain, depending on lung or heart involvement or both. Uh, abnormal counts that can kind of manifest itself in uh, easy bruising big bruises, bleeding problems, clotting problems, um, joint pain and inflammation, um, fluid retention with puffiness, T-colored urine, which will mean that blood in the urine that can make us worry about kidney involvement related to lupus, uh, sores in, in the mouth, um, and uh, a change in the colors that are um, uh, triggered by cold exposures. And I'll show you some picture of that. Um, and that can manifest also with some ulcers in the tip of the fingers uh, with that. So how many type of lupus there is? So the systemic lupus um, is the one that not only can manifest with a skin involvement, but also affecting the, uh, or the potential to affect other organs in your body. Cutaneous lupus, there's a variety of them. They're mainly focused on a skin involvement. The risk of transitioning from cutaneous to systemic is really low. And with a cutaneous lupus, we don't have the risk of, you know, kidney damage and ending up on dialysis. And that's a different kind of uh, lupus. There's drug-induced lupus, which you have features of lupus that are not just by themselves, not just triggered 
but rather triggered by medications. Um, and in these kind of uh, uh, lupus is taking away the uh, inducing uh, factor will make the patient feel better. So those are kind of easier, hopefully, to treat and control. The fourth kind is neonatal lupus. So newborn with some manifestation um, of the lupus. Who's at risk? When we look at uh, within the United States, it's it, it, lupus is affecting 1.5 million Americans. So it's not rare, it's not unusual. 90% um, of these uh, patients are female. So it really, so the ratio is nine to one. So more females than males are affected with lupus. And 15% of these patients are kids. So all of us have to be aware of what are the features? When should I worry about this? When should I go to the doctor? When should I take my child to a specialist? So it's what we call women of childbearing age. So young females are the one who are most affected. There is some ethnic uh, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity that uh, will, uh, do worse or have a, a higher risk of complication because of the lupus. And that includes African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic and Latino, and Native Americans. And we, don't, we still don't know why, but there is that. And who's at the higher risk is people who have a family history of autoimmune disease. So it doesn't have to be the lupus as a family history. It could be a rheumatoid arthritis or a psoriatic arthritis. Or, so having a, an autoimmune disease within the family will put you at the higher risk of developing an autoimmune disease. We're going to move to um, some of these pictures with, you know, the uh, manifestation. And I think people will kind of remember more how these uh, uh, manifestation will look like. So this is a, a newborn uh, with a, a lupus rash, and this is the neonatal lupus. Uh, male rash, uh, the butterfly rash, uh, you could see it in one of uh, young females, how it affects, you know, the nose, the bridge, and over the cheeks, but it spares the area around the mouth and that's kind of typical we even it looks like a wolf you know um, so that's one of the features uh, another example is the um, discoid rash and how it can be or it can look different in an african-american patient versus a caucasian so we have to be aware of these um, skin changes uh, would we'll be careful because they're kind of sensitive to the sun and the worse the uh, rash, uh, the higher the chance of these being, you know, ending up with scars. Uh, and uh, so another manifestation is the hair loss, alopecia, and it's usually the scalp is inflamed. The uh, red, um, like you see on uh, the right of the slide, and then once it's he's, the, it heals and the scalp is uh, not inflamed, um, so that's another uh, feature of uh, the lupus. Here, there's uh, another rash, uh, Levitu reticularis, on your the left, which is kind of a marbling of the skin, as if it's a lacy skin, um, and. Uh, in some of the lupus patients, um, they could be at higher risk of having, as we said, bleeding and or clotting problems. Uh, in about 20% uh, uh, of the cases that could be you know, associated with this specific rash and uh, problem with maybe recurrent miscarriages or blood clots. So those are, this is an important thing that we look for when we are examining our patients. The picture on the right is uh, uh, for the Raynaud phenomena, as we said that it's triggered with cold and you go three, through these three phases of different colors. It could be in the toes or in the fingers or both. Uh, 
it can affect only one finger or all you know and it starts with the whitish discoloration then you get the blue and red with some pain or tingling also so that's also common in uh, uh, lupus but it could be present in other autoimmune diseases also and uh, at some uh, uh, cases it could be severe where the blood flow to the finger could be compromised and you can end up with ulcers in the tip of the fingers Another uh, features of lupus is the oral ulceration and the, it's usually in the heart palate and, um, um, and it could be, you know, uh, definitely it's important to examine the mucosa of the patients. Arthritis is another feature. Uh, in lupus patient, the joint involvement could be a little different from um, other arth arthritis like the osteoarthritis or the rheumatoid arthritis to the patient, you know, the pain is there, the deformity could be happening, but in the lupus patient, those deformities um, are reducible. What I mean is you could still straighten those finger and the hands can look like this and you do the x-rays and they'll say the joints are good. So it's not really affecting the joint, but the capsule around the joint is what is affected in lupus patient. And the risk of damage to the joint is less likely to happen in lupus versus rheumatoid arthritis, for example. So if you see a hand like that in a rheumatoid arthritis patient, that deformity like the uh, swan neck uh, in the uh, middle finger, and, um, and you cannot straighten that finger. And that's an, a good, important feature for us to kind of uh, uh, look for. So how is lupus, how do we diagnose lupus? Lupus is a clinical diagnosis. So what I'm, we mean by, there's no specific test that is going to tell you you have it or you don't. You definitely need the specialist uh, to take a full history, do a, a full physical exam, try to figure out which symptoms are worrisome or a high yield for the possibility of autoimmune disease and order some blood test and a urine test. And with that, you can have like the, you, the, the high suspicion for the lupus. In some cases, let's say if we're dealing with kidney damage, and we want to know, are we dealing with a nephritis? Then maybe a biopsy is needed. Uh, definitely imaging uh, to try and uh, find out, is there an organ damage? Let's say, for example, if we're worried about the uh, lung involvement, uh, we might be uh, ordering uh, imaging and things like that. Um, so the, the, it, there's no, it could be different from one patient to another. How do we reach that conclusion of, okay, these signs and symptoms and results are definitely consistent with systemic lupus erythematosus, or we could reach out to a different conclusion uh, from one patient to the other. And that's why we say it's a clinical diagnosis. We'll move to the treatment. Um, so the goal of the treatment, uh, first thing that I want to point out is there's no cure. So it, it's a chronic disease. Uh, our goal is remission. Um, so the variety of uh, treatment uh, can reduce symptoms, limit damage, and reduce recurrence. That's the goal of the therapy. And to reach that, a lupus patient need regular follow-up uh, with uh, their specialist uh, because it could the lupus could start with manifestations and over time things can change and evolve. So it could be affecting the skin, you take the medication, the rash is gone, and then despite everything else we're doing, 
something else could be happening like a kidney damage or blood clots or so there is no um stability or it could be acting up and then it goes and you reach remission over time and that's why we say regular follow-up is the key to reach the remission and minimize future damage lifestyle modification are very important uh, for lupus patient uh, mainly for the sun protection because of the different photosensitivity the rashes stress reduction is very important um, diet and uh, healthy nutrition is uh, uh, key um, keeping active avoiding smoking being up to date in vaccination are important and in um, well-known fact is that sulfur based medication could be triggering fact, uh, flares uh, so avoiding sulfur based medication is recommended since we talk about how lupus affects the young females then we can't be talking about treatment without talking about pregnancies so even without the antiphospholipid and lupus anticoagulant present like we said that marbling of the skin rash and how it can be affected or you know uh, uh, in the presence of these abnormal uh, uh, blood finding lupus patients are at a high risk of miscarriage even without a specific etiology and that can be at higher risk when the disease is not stable is not in remission um, that's why we uh, want patient to control the disease and then plan the pregnancy so that you end up with a, a successful pregnancy that it's carried to term so they are also at a higher risk of preterm labor we touch base a little bit on the neonatal lupus how that uh, a newborn with a rash and uh, some uh, a smaller subgroup uh, the uh, newborn could be at a high risk of heart block so that's something where your gyn specialist and your rheumatologist have to communicate to make sure that should we worry about heart block in the newborn as a complication of the planned pregnancy and uh, um, kind of monitor uh, mom and baby accordingly so that's definitely uh, important the other thing for the young uh, uh, females is contraception so if i'm have lupus and uh, i should plan a pregnancy then are all birth control methods equal and the answer is no um, so uh, the choice of birth con control is an important uh, uh, decision uh, because some of these uh, uh, methods can uh, increase the risk of flares and complication with the lupus um, so we should be avoiding oestrogen um, for our lupus patient. Um, so the better option is progestin-based IUD or the uh, progestin-only uh, pills or low-oestrogen-based uh, um, uh, pills. Um, so the one things to avoid is the um, patch implant uh, vaginal ring that are kind of um, estrogen base and we have to know that choosing the injectable birth control can put our patients at a higher risk of uh, osteoporosis uh, which when we're dealing with an autoimmune disease at a young age that we often uh, use the uh, prednisone to help with a flare so now we have two things that can put our patient at a higher risk of osteoporosis uh, so if we can avoid the injectable birth control that will be um, our uh, preference from that standpoint
So the last uh, uh, part of uh, our treatment is the different medication. Um, Anti-inflammatory medication is definitely widely used because of the joint involvement. Um, the systemic steroids we touch base on because those are the medication that are absorbed uh, quickly and act uh, immediately to help uh, um, with the flares. Um, but uh, these glucocorticoids will suppress the immune system. We use them at different dosage depending on what is at stakes, what are the uh, features of the lupus flare that we're trying to uh, treat. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine-based medication are widely used. Uh, it's kind of the baseline. Um, it's a medication that it's an old medicine that has been found not only to help with rashes, joint pain, uh, and the uh, alopecia, the baldness, but also even preventing the risk of clotting in the long term um, and help preventing uh, uh, serious complication uh, to the uh, organs over time. So when we compare patients with lupus on uh, the hydroxychloroquine versus the same group without and monitor them over 20 years, we figure out that the hydroxychloroquine played a role in minimizing damage over that period of time. Um, so unless there is a, a contraindication, we prefer that all of our patients to be on the hydroxychloroquine. Then depending on how the, uh, these manifestations uh, of the lupus are kind of not under control or we need more, we have uh, the uh, other immunosuppressive medication that includes uh, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, and cyclophosphamide, which is uh, either oral or uh, uh, infusion. The uh, belumumab, which is the Benlista, could be infusion or self-injection. And then the rituximab, which is an infusion. And the other first three are uh, uh, methotrexate could be um, uh, an oral uh, medication. The azathioprine and the mycophenolate are uh, pills. So I will uh, conclude uh, my presentation uh, by uh, these uh, two quotes. Um, I define who I am. Lupus is just a bully. I beat every morning when I got out of bed. And that's definitely a daily struggle for these lupus patients. Um, and we have to kind of um, assess that on a regular basis. Uh, uh, um, explain it, address it, and support them uh, uh, on the long term. And the other quote is, lupus changes people, it sculpts us into someone who understands more deeply, hurts more often, appreciates more quickly, cries more easily, hopes more desperately, loves more openly, and lives more passionately. So and I wanted to close that on a positive, a positive note. I'm uh, happy to address any questions. So I see here uh, one question that says, what diet recommendation do you make to patient? There is so much conflicting information about what to eat. Um, so um, I would say avoiding processed food, just go back to the basic, you know, fresh ingredient uh, um, uh, will be the main uh, uh, recommendation. Um, so a healthier uh, lifestyle uh, can definitely uh, be helpful. Uh, some people will do the anti-inflammatory diet, depending on, you know, what are the manifestations. If they're struggling with the arthritis and the fatigue, uh, uh, but when it comes to, for example, kidney damage and nephritis, it's not like we don't have data that would tell us that this is, you know, had a, 
uh, statistically significant impact on that. Let's see if there is. Um, If you have any questions, anyone, please go ahead and feel free to take yourself off mute or include those questions in the chat. Oh, it looks like we have another one that popped up, Dr. Bowali. Yes. There was a, a question about uh, lupus and the COVID vaccine. Yes, so um, when it comes to uh, the COVID vaccine, it's not a live vaccine. Um, the only contraindication for the COVID vaccine is allergy um, to the vaccine itself, which you really don't know if you have it or you don't. Um, having lupus is like any other chronic diseases. So we worry that patient with uh, such uh, malfunction of the immune system can do worse compared to their um, other patients, same age and uh, same sex. Um, and even if they're on immunosuppressive medication, we strongly recommend uh, for our patient to get their vaccine. Uh, there was also a follow-up question regarding the diet, uh, specifically related to animal products. So uh, is there uh, data correlating if we are vegetarian or vegan, um, can we do better? I'm not aware of such study. Um, so um, I don't know if... Um, Dr. Pawaskar um, uh, can uh, maybe uh, add to that, but um, um, we definitely not kind of influencing or encouraging patients to go vegetarian or vegan uh, just because of the autoimmune diseases in general or lupus in particular. Uh, hi, Dr. Pawaskar here. Uh, just to add to Dr. Uh, Bawali, there is, isn't really any uh, you know, good quality data out there that shows that like particularly vegetarian diet is better over non-vegetarian diet. So I don't really have any specific recommendations to make on that end. But what I would recommend is like in general, if you want to, you know, limit the amount of red meat you eat, that's something that's in general a good thing for your health. And And again, I want to clarify that doesn't mean you don't eat any red meat at all. You just want to relatively limited. That's that's the only thing I have to add really. But otherwise there's really no data on any one kind of diet that's superior over the other or something like that. Uh, and that recommendation will come because as an autoimmune disease with um, inflammatory things by itself, the lupus as an entity, we noticed that our patients are at the high risk of cardiovascular complication when they are not controlled. So when the lupus is not in remission or under a good control, over time, cardiovascular complications are higher. Um, so we could always go back to that healthy diet where, you know, uh, we don't eliminate things, but we just focus on the right balance uh, for sure. Dr. Bawali, there's another question in the chat. Should family members of lupus patients be screened or only if they start to have symptoms? Yeah, we do not recommend screening for family members um, when they're asymptomatic, uh, but definitely updating your family history to your uh, uh, primary care physician is important. So let's say your mom or your sister have been diagnosed with lupus. It would be nice to for your doctor to know that. So if future complain of, sometimes it's even something that you wouldn't even think about, but because your doctor know that family history, they might be 
uh, more um, prone to say, okay, oh, you had a blood clot. Oh, let's see, maybe we have, maybe we should worry about something, right? Um, so we, we, we definitely don't recommend a screening for asymptomatic because, for example, the ANA, uh, there's a lot of low titer ANA positivity uh, that you don't know what to do with, you know, so you don't have the features that will make us worry about um, a specific diagnosis. Um, so um, ordering the test without specific symptoms, uh, a lot of the time it doesn't help, you know, so and then it will put that patient worrying about what will happen in the future. Okay, we have one more question in the chat. Is lupus a blood condition problem? So uh, I'll go back to the um, uh, etiology where we said it's a multifactorial. So abnormal counts is, could be a manifestation of um, uh, the uh, disease, like a low white count, anemia, low platelets, easy bruising, bleeding problem, clotting problem, but it's not specifically defined as a blood condition problem uh, because it's a lot more than that, right? So, um, or doing an ANA uh, test um, by itself on itself doesn't give you the diagnosis of lupus, which is a lot of this misconception that uh, uh, would say that they check an ANA and it's low positive and the way uh, it's explained to the patient uh, uh, is say, oh, your test result came back positive for lupus. And then we see the patients and we talk to them, examining them, do whatever test that it's needed and then we tell them we're not worried about lupus. Then the patient ends up being confusing um, so I would say we check the lab work and something came back a little abnormal. We just want to check it out for, if you want, even put that possibility or whatever, but just don't make it as this test equivalent to lupus. And then we kind of end up contradicting each other in, in that case scenario. Um, All right, any more questions? As I said, feel free to either add them to the chat or take yourself off mute and ask them directly. All right, well, with no further questions, I'd like to say thank you once again to Dr. Bowali and her team. Uh, this has been such a, a wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, and thank you to each of you for joining us as well. Uh, we hope you'll join us for the next installment of this series, which will be on Tuesday, May 25th. Um, we'll be presenting on rheumatoid arthritis and it will be uh, Colette O'Brien, who's a nurse practitioner with UHS uh, rheumatology as well. Uh, to register, please call 607-337-4183, or you can email me at melissa.stegnaro at nyuhs.org. Uh, thanks for joining us for today for this first installment of our Lunchtime Learning Series, brought to you by UHS Shenango Memorial Hospital and the UHS Rheumatology Team. Thank you. Bye. Melissa? Yeah. Will you? Will like that you're recording this? Will the recording?